Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. So we're going to talk a little bit about quantitative coronary angiography and the limitations of quantitative coronary angiography on assessing atherosclerosis uh, reversal right, or quote unquote uh, regression uh, or progression. And uh, we'll talk about this because it's been coming up a lot and it's uh, published in a decent amount of papers. So what is a uh, quantitative coronary angiography? What are the basic principles? So um, the slides uh, I'm going to share with the uh, permission of Charles Michael Gibson. He's a, um, he's a cardiologist and an interventionalist at Harvard. And he's actually pioneered uh, quantitative, uh, a lot of the methods in quantitative coronary angiography. He's also come up with the Timmy frame count. Um, so he's considered a giant in the field. So a couple of basic uh, things here. So I'm going to be posting in the general chat. So for those who want to follow along, when you're reading um, quantitative coronary angiography, you're seeing the difference in. So essentially, there's a difference in, in brightness. And the, the reason for that is that the artery is casting a shadow in x-ray film. You're, see, you're going to see a dark area at the edges of the artery and wherever the blood is, because remember, this is what this is, is a luminogram. And so it's, what it's giving you is blood volume in three-dimensional geometric space. Now, this is important. Um, there's technically no delineation that is absolute in these arteries, in, in these luminograms. Um, you really, if you look, it's really what it is, it's a tapering off of the, of the brightness into essentially darkness. And you can have certain automated consistent programs that can delineate where it would consider the best guess for brightness and darkness to where the artery edges. Um, but you really can't, um, it's really not uh, something that is uh, sharply demarcated. And just to give you examples, in some cases, it could be a pixel length, um, depending on the caliber of the artery. So here's an example of that. So in this example, um, you can actually have a, an artery that is actually one, <laughs> um, the, the pixel, uh, and you, that's the delineation. Now, it's, we're not having problem, problems with that in many of the cases, but uh, the idea is that the smaller the artery is, that the, the potential greater of the variance is where you're drawing your, your line. Now, these aren't major problems in quantitative coronary angiography by any means. Um, but what I want to do, um, and here I'll just show you the example of the computer automated program just or you or it could be done manually. Um, sorry, that's not it. Drawing in the delineation of the of the artery. And this is the example of that. Now, the thing to remember here is that when you're looking at quantitative coronary angiography, um, there's a lot of frames that can happen in the uh, in the same angiogram. So when you're looking at, if you're, for example, looking at a angiogram at baseline and an angiogram at follow up, and oh, Danielle's asking how to hear the talk. She, someone explains to Danielle how to do my voice check. <clears throat> What you're going to see here is you're going to see something that would look like reversal or regression. So I'll give you an example of that. So can everyone see the, um, this slide that shows how long did it take for the lesion to regress? Everyone? No one's talking? All right. 
Um, so, trying to help Daniel. Oh, okay. We can, we can, yeah, that's fine. Hey, she made it. Look who's here. Okay. So this is one of the really cool things that um, that Dr. Gibson actually showed us. So this was, um, <clears throat> this is an example of, I'll just post it again. So if you guys can see, it looks like there's a little bit of progression here, right? From baseline to follow-up. So you can see how there's stenosis, that there's narrowing, and that at the end there's a little bit, you can actually, if you'd eyeball it, you may even call this a 10% increase, uh, uh, improvement in stenosis, or maybe a 0.2, or something, a minimal increase in minimal luminal diameter. Now the question that was asked was, how long did this take to regress? And the answer is, it probably was a few seconds, because this was actually just a different frame in the same angiogram. And so what accounts for this? Um, and the, what accounts for it is that the, you have to understand that the frame to frame difference is highly variable. And the reason why is that one of the, well, there's a number of reasons why. One of the reasons why is that arteries are not um, spherical, they're elliptical, and they're rotating through space through the cardiac cycle. And so I'll give you an example of that here. So here's where you're getting the elliptical view. The view from uh, one of the axes. And here is the view. Can, it's not loading. Okay, Discord is not uploading this thing for some reason. Let me try that again. Okay, there we go. So you'll notice as the artery uh, rotates, uh, as its ellipse rotates through space, um, that in and of itself can cause the appearance of regression and progression, even during the same angiogram. So all of these things can cause, so rotation, foreshadowing, changes in, in out of frame magnification. Um, uh, even even the where you are in the cardiac cycle, uh, whether you're end diastole or whether you're in systole, can change the percent stenosis and the minimal luminal diameter. So we can see that over here. And there's gonna be data on this. Um, there's, so let's go through couple things, the variability. So so you can get a decent amount of stenosis variation just with the frame to frame variability. And where you are in the cardiac cycle, let's see if I can find that. So it's important to standardize all of this for where you are in the cardiac cycle, because if you're in, if you can think about it, if you're in systole, uh, early systole, or versus you're in end diastole, when you're taking the different frames, the their coronary arteries are going to be experiencing different amounts of pressure and volume of blood coming at them, and so you can understand that they're going to be they're going to appear different, um, and so you, it takes a lot of work to actually standardize all of this. Now, let's just say that there's also other um, issues like pincushion effects. We don't have to go through all of them. But let's just say you can, whatever plethora, and there is a plethora, of variations, problems, and all the things you have to do to make quantitative coronary angiography um, something that, does, that has precision. And even if you do a trial where you have a control group and you have a 
experimental group. And even if you want to say like all of those things are randomized out in the control group, there's further issues in evaluating uh, progression and regression of plaque. So I'll give you two conceptual um, issues. Um, one is the major one. So here's a conceptual issue. And then we'll go through the actual data. So I want you to just take a look at this thing right here. So if you look at uh, the pre and post, you can see that there is a normal, in the pre slide, you can see there's a normal reference artery and you can see that there is a stenosis clearly. And post intervention, what you can see is that the reference artery has decreased in size. Now, in quantitative coronary angiography, there's a minimal luminal diameter, there's a percent stenosis. The way it's calculated is that the minimal luminal diameter is divided by the reference artery to give you a percent stenosis. Now, the assumption that we make over here is that the reference artery is free of disease. It's free of atherosclerosis. But there's data showing, once we had things like IVAS, that that assumption very often is not true. So the assumption very often fails, and it turns out what we considered a normal reference artery, be it proximal or distal to the stenosis, often has diffuse atherosclerosis. Now, if that atherosclerosis in progresses, if it increases, and there isn't, relative to that increase, there isn't as much increase in the stenotic segment, then that's what you actually see over here. Now, the reason this is interesting is because think about what's going to happen to your percent stenosis. If your minimal luminal diameter stays roughly the same or doesn't de decrease a little bit, and your reference diameter decreases a lot or plaque progresses, what actually happens to your percent stenosis is it actually improves. And so it looks like regression. If you have that as one of your metrics, it looks like regression. In fact, this can happen even if minimal luminal diameter increases a little bit. As long as the increase in the minimal luminal diameter is less than the, uh, comparatively less than the in than the worsening of the reference diameter. Because at the end of the day, it's just relative. It's one divided by the other. And so if there's disease progression in the reference diameter to a greater degree than there's disease regression in the stenotic segment, then what you actually get at the end of the day is it'll look like regression. But no one reasonable would call that regression. It's progression. On the net, you have more plaque. On the net, you your arteries are more clogged. So regression actually can look like progression. Uh, there are cases where that can actually be vice versa. Um, we don't have to get into those. There's another there's another phenomena uh, such that the um, the stenotic segment of the artery. The, the thing to consider is that the stenotic segment of the artery and the reference diameter are not um, coextensive in their dilation and contraction. That is to say, they can in those segments, different segments of the same coronary artery can have relatively different degrees of dilation and constriction relative to one another. So it's not like this metal pipe tube that has to like change its volume because and whatever change in volume on one end of the tube will require change in volume the other end too. Like it's it's a fluid. Like arteries are fluid. They're they're more malleable than that. And so one segment of the same artery can constrict while the other can dilate. And that's a phenomenon that does happen in stenotic segments of coronary arteries. It happens up until around 40 to 50 percent. It's a it's a compensatory mechanism that it makes the vessel, that segment of the vessel, ectatic. And the, the reason for that is just to preserve flow. 
But the issue is, if on baseline you had the reference segment on a dilated day, and then on the follow-up you had the reference segment on a contracted day, the, the same issue applies if you have that compensatory dilation just of the stenotic segment, because the stenotic segment will be dilating relative to the reference segment, which is now on a contracted day. It's not going to share the same dilation. And you, you, that can actually give you an increase in minimal luminal diameter um, relative, or definitely a, a, an improvement in percent stenosis. Um, and same issue. It's just, it, even if the amount of plaque there is the same, it, it, even if the amount of plaque there, theoretically, even if it increased somewhat, you can look at that as regression in percent, in, in percent stenosis when, in fact, progression is happening. And so these are just conceptual things to keep in mind. But, you know, so you might think, well, okay, you've given me some conceptual case, like how, how common does this actually take place? Like, is this actually a thing? And how often does this happen? And even if you're going to give me some conceptual cases, I mean, at the end of the day, can't you say that they're still on the net, a correlation that they're still on the net gives, there's some reason for us to believe that quantitative coronary angiography um, gives us some reason to believe that plaque can uh, increase or decrease based on what the metrics are in the quantitative coronary angiography, even if it's not perfect, even if it's not exact, even if it's not a one-to-one -one correlate. And the answer to that is no, not really, unless there's high cut points like a you separate the data into categorical data based on 0 0.4 min uh, millimeter and minimal luminal diameter change. Other than that, as you can see with variable, variable, there's actually no correlation between metrics of quantitative coronary angiography and the change in plaque volume, as measured by uh, modalities that actually measure plaque volume, like IVUS. And here is a paper actually showing that. So before, it's very interesting. I'm, I'll share two papers with you guys. So all of these uh, conceptual problems and more have been detailed in the literature. They've been reported, but there was never a quantitative case to make of this, to actually show that it really is that unreliable. And it actually, not to just unreliable, it actually gives us no reason to believe there's progression rather than regression when it says one way or the other. So I'm going to link a paper. So this is the first paper that came out talking about this issue. So this was a review paper on the limitations of angiography for analyzing coronary atherosclerosis progression or regression. Both of these two issues I spoke about are listed in the paper along with a whole bunch of history in the different trials looking at progression and regression. And you'll notice that they actually conclude in their conclusion before any of this nail in the coffin quantitative data comes out. Their conclusion is just given the current limitations, serial coronary angiography is not a satisfactory means of detecting atherosclerosis progression or regression. Now, if I were, when I read this paper, I was like, okay, this is really cool. I didn't actually feel confident making that conclusion because there was always a lingering question in my mind, like, okay, I understand there are these issues with quantitative coronary angiography. I understand that, okay, you can have progression when in fact there's regression. You can have, you, the, and you can have regression when there's in fact regression and vice versa. You can have, you, and you can have nothing when there's something. Like the, you can have all of that, but at the end of the day, the question lingering in my mind was, is there any correlation at all? So even if it's unreliable, if there's some correlation then it can give you some amount of reason for the needle to shift one way or the other in your belief. If the QCA tells you regression is happening, does it at the very least make it more likely for you to believe that plaque is decreasing? If the QCA tells you that progression is happening, whether it's through minimum lumen diameter or percent stenosis, does that give you reason to believe that plaque is increasing? And just from this review paper alone, I didn't know the answer to that. And I wasn't comfortable with this conclusion just based on that. So 
now I am though, because now we do actually have uh, a publication on this that actually looked specifically in this uh, at this relationship. And uh, there is one person I do have to thank for this publication, for finding it, and um, sincerely, like his 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 name is Mike the Vegan. He actually found the paper that just destroys quantitative coronary angiography for assessing plaque progression and regression. Although, admittedly, when he found the paper, he thought it supported the case, but it actually completely destroyed the case. But I do have to thank him for that. And here it is. So we'll link it in general. So this is where they actually put it to the test. So there was a randomized controlled trial on an ACAT inhibitor. And it was two years long. They did quantitative coronary angiography and IVUS at baseline. And at two years, again, they did quantitative coronary angiography and IVUS at two years follow-up to see who progressed, to see it, who stayed the same, to see if there was any change in their plaque volume and the metrics of quantitative coronary angiography. And the question they were trying to answer is, do these things actually correlate? Does the change in the metrics of quantitative coronary angiography actually correlate with the changes in plaque regression or progression? So it's that you have to, a lot of, uh, this paper can be taken out of context very easily. So you actually have to read the whole thing. So I'll just skip to the end. I mean, the answer is no. Percent, something called percent atheroma volume weakly correlates. However, percent atheroma volume is not the same thing as absolute plaque volume. You can actually have an increase in plaque and have a decrease in percent atheroma volume if you, your artery just dilates. But no one reasonable would call that reversal or regression of disease. So the real question is, what's happening to the absolute plaque volume? What's happening to the plaque? Is it increasing or is it decreasing? And when they investigate this question as a continuous variable, here's what you find. You find that the answer is there's actually no correlation whatsoever. So that's table four and five in the study. And not only is there... I'm, no correlation. I'm not just talking about a non-statistically significant correlation. I'll post what the tables look like in general. I'm actually talking about a not just a non-statistically significant correlation, but a correlation where the R values are literally sitting at zero, like adjacent to it, abutting, kissing the toes of the zero value. It's the, the, the R value. People look at R values of 0.1 or 0.05, and they'll laugh at it. But these R values are 0 0.02, negative 0 0.002, 0 0.03, 0 0.06, 0 0.03, etc. This is no correlation whatsoever. The, it's not just not statistically significant. The, the point estimates are just abutting the zero. And what that tells you is that when whether it's your change in uh, summation of stenosis score, percent stenosis score, whether it's your change in your average summation of change in minimal luminal diameter, that actually doesn't give you any reason at all to, to conclude or even lean in the direction of regression or progression at all. It gives you no reason. You have just as much reason to conclude regression from a QCA that tells you progression, and you have just as much reason to conclude progression in a QCA that concludes regression. Unless you have categorical data. If you stratify it by categorical data with high cut points, and, what, and we'll get into what I mean, you can have a correlation. So what they found, one interesting thing they found, when they, they say, okay, we understand as a continuous variable there's no correlation, but let's say we categorize the patients based on cut points. So let's say we separate everyone out 
for people who achieved an, an improve a worsening or improvement of 0.4 millimeters in minimal luminal diameter. For those who decreased uh, it, by 0.4 minimal, millimeters minimal luminal diameter or greater, we'll call them true uh, progressors. And for those people who had an increase in their minimal luminal diameter of 0.4 millimeters or greater, we'll call them true regressors. And when you do that, there are some other criteria as well involving uh, other high cut points like 20% stenosis. But the point is when you do something like that, do you get a correlation? Do you get statistically significant results um, for those you're studying? And the answer is yes for some plaques. So for plaque volumes that are not extraordinarily large, uh, well, not, I don't know, I shouldn't say extraordinarily, but I'll just be specific. Um, the average um, plaque volume in millimeters cubed, uh, 146 uh, point estimate, 190 point estimate, those you do see a correlation. You do see a relationship. Um, for, two, for the larger ones than that, you may be able to argue something, um, but it wasn't, it certainly wasn't statistically significant. Now, I'll just point out that none, in none of the um, dietary trials for any diet did a change of 0.4 millimeters luminal, minimal, luminal diameter, um, it, it hasn't been shown. Not only hasn't been shown, it, it didn't come close to that. So another interesting point to note is that and this is just a hypothesis of mine, and I'd really love to see the scatter plots because it's a really it's a shame that they didn't. But if you think about it, if there is a correlation at the high cut points, both like positive and negative, and there is no overall correlation, it may not be statistically significant, um, but there should be, you would expect in between the cut points, there to be some sort of opposite correlation since these correlations are being run on a linear regression. So in essence, it'll look, this is something I was at work thinking about, and I just decided to take a paper and draw it out just to figure out um, if I was making any sense at all. And here's what I drew. <laughs> And this, I'm not saying this is, this is a hypothesis of mine. I mean, regardless of anything, there's no correlation. The case is done for QCA. But this is, this is just an interesting thing that may follow mathematically. So we'll look at my little doodle here. And what I have on the x-axis is a change in minimal luminal diameter. I have the points that were used, plus uh, 0.4 in millimeters and minus 0.4 millimeters. And I have the change the delta in AV, that's atheroma vol volume. I'm talking about absolute atheroma volume. And this is what you would expect. If you expect the change to be uh, positive in minimal luminal diameter, then what you would expect the change in atheroma volume to be, um, really, I should have, <laughs> just a side note, uh, my axes should be switched. The independent variable is in the wrong place. So the X and Y axis should be switched, but it's immaterial. It doesn't actually matter. Um, so as the minimal luminal diameter increases, you would expect to see a decrease in atheroma volume if there was a correlation. And as the minimal luminal diameter decreases, you would expect to see an increase in atheroma volume. Make sense to everyone? Hope so. Makes sense to me anyway. But the thing is, if you only see a correlation when you ignore all the data in between the negative 0.4 and the positive 0.4. You actually have to like wipe away all those data points to see a correlation. And when you include the data points in between those two values, you see the correlation sitting at zero. What it seems that it would actually be, if I had to guess what those scatter plots would be, is something like the actual scatter plot here. Now, this is an oversimplification. In reality, I expect the scatter plot to be much more messy. And I've just made it clear for the sake of demonstration is that there is a negative correlation at the cut points and beyond. But in between those cut points, there's the opposite correlation. 
And that makes sense for a linear regression because you have to have a, some sort of correlation balancing something else out to get to zero. Now, I could be wrong on this, but I don't see how I could be mathematically. Um, I'm not saying the opposite correlation maybe is necessarily statistically significant if we were to avoid the cut points and beyond. But I don't understand any other way to get to a, a R value close to zero. But this is interesting because if you'll notice, all the diets, dietary interventions that used quantitative coronary ion geography and looked at changes in minimal lumen diameter, uh, they either found that they're all in this range. They're all in the range of between the change that happens all seem to be in the range of between an increase or decrease of 0.4 millimeters, which means that within that range, there may be reason to think that the quantitative coronary angiography is actually telling you the opposite of what you thought it was. That may, there may actually be evidence to suggest that within this range, there is, the, the QCA is quite frankly lying to you. And only when you go, you go to the cut points and beyond is the QCA giving you more reason to, t to conclude what it's saying than not. I shouldn't say lying to you, that's being a little bit hyperbolic. Um, the way to phrase that would be that within between the two cut points, there may be reason to conclude that if QCA metrics tell you that there is regression, you actually may have more reason to conclude progression. And if the QCA tells you progression, you actually may have more reason to conclude regression. Now, there are other points to be made. Um, there's myocardial perfusion studies. Uh, there's uh, EF studies, um, all of those things fundamentally underdetermine plaque. They underdetermine change in plaque volume. There's a million and a half different reasons that that can happen, irrespective of changes in plaque. Uh, we can go through a whole bunch of there's dilation, there's collateral formation, there's uh, even just uh, inducive for inducible ischemia, like even just rest, just like a decrease in cardiac output can just decrease your demand and have less inducible ischemia. There's so many things that can uh, cause a... And so the, the bottom line is what's the reason to conclude that there's these things are happening because of a decrease in plaque rather than a... Uh, rather than any combination of arrival hypotheses. So in short, um, I don't see any reason that any of the evidence presented gives us reason to conclude gives us reason to conclude that plaque has decreased and if i don't have any reason to conclude that plaque has decreased how can i say that plaque i mean obviously how can i say that plaque has regressed and if i can't say how the plaque was regressed how can i say that plaque was reversed if i can't say how the plaque was reversed how can i say that ascvd is reversed. Cor atherosclerotic coronary artery disease is reversed. And if anyone has any thoughts about this, please run them by me. I, if I'm wrong, I do want to know about it. But fundamentally, it just seems like we don't have any reason to conclude that there was a decrease in plaque. For any of these studies using these modalities. And if anyone has any if anyone has any objections, I'm all ears. If anyone wants to try to make the case that there is reason to conclude that plaque regressed, I, I really would love to hear it. In virtue of uh, of any given intervention. Okay. Well, I will continue looking. I will continue searching for the refutation of my case. I have made it public. I have posted it on. I posted on social media for a while now, and I'm still waiting. And I'm I'm hoping that someone will take it down. I'm hoping that someone will find. Oh, do we even have tools to observe regression in plaque? Yes, we do. There are several tools we have to observe regression in plaque, and those are the imaging modalities that actually measure plaque volume. So. The tools we have are IVIS, OCT, 
and uh, computer tomography. So we have the imaging modality. In fact, there's a recent trial, though I'll quibble with it, uh, the evaporate trial. If anyone, I don't, we don't have to get into the evaporate trial now, but this is actually what they did. They, they used imaging modality that, attempt, that quantified plaque volume. So we do, we, we can test. In fact, this is this very reason we have to conclude that quantitative coronary angiography, the changes in quantitative angiography over time don't actually track with the changes in plaque volume is because they were tested against imaging modalities that measure plaque volume. So at the end of the day, QCA has utility, it has value. It all depends on the question you're asking. If you're asking the question of, you know, can I get a geometric assessment of the lumen of this artery or where the blood is in three dimensional space, yeah, you can get something like that. If you're asking the question is, can I assess a change in plaque with QCA without high cut points? The answer is no, uh, it has, or at least it hasn't been shown. And as a continuous variable, it has been shown to be no overall. So there's that. Any questions? All right. Well, if that's all, I'll take off. But thanks for listening, guys. Um, while you're available, is there, are you free to take any other questions on other stuff? If anyone wants to ask. Yeah, sure. Well, I guess they don't have other questions for other stuff either. All right. <laughs> People are tired today. It's okay. <laughs>